just constantly, constantly changing and improving, and everything is timed, everything is metric, and yeah. you know, I was like, it takes this guy eight seconds to do this process, and da da da. Right. And how do you do that? And this is the space we have, and all that. So yeah. yeah. Every square inch and second is maximized, right? Yeah. He is. I mean, he, he went and got his own bubble wrap making machine. Right. Because right. he found out that it cost two tenths of a cent less for every box. Yeah. It, was, it was absolutely, yeah. He is, he is better at his job than anyone at the company. It's a good job. It's <laughs> great. Yeah. Um, all right, let me uh, just go through a little bit of a pre-flight checklist here. Uh, here we go. All right, so silence your phone. Um, uh, let's see. Speak. This is your mic, so you're speaking into that as, as much as possible if you can. Try not to, like talk off because it's mm -hmm. like a unidirectional thing so like okay just try Should to get it closer to me or you're i'm on it too so okay. like yeah yeah, so we'll if, yeah that's okay. good um try not to tap the table like when you talk although a lot of people like to do that um but i'll, I'll sort of just remind you i'll if mm -hmm. you do it i'll just sort of make that sound uh checking the levels can you just give me a mic check one two one two mic check one two one two three mic. okay cool uh, clock is ticking. This will be completely edited after the fact, so we take the oh. whole thing and then edit it down. Okay. Um, therefore, if you feel like you said something that you're like, wait, strike that off the record, just say that and the editor will hear it, so you'll be good with that. Uh, I have some notes. I might occasionally look down on my phone, so I'm not checking my emails. Um, let me take 10 seconds of room tone right now, just complete silence for 10 seconds. Cool. All right. Sweet. Okay. Ready? You're in a comfortable position. This floor is kind of loud, so if you could try not to roll around, like yep. it's very loud on the chair. Okay. Um, so, intro: who you are, what you do. Tell us who you are. My name is Josh Luber. I am the CEO and co-founder of StockX. Okay. What is StockX? StockX is the world's first stock market of things. Um, that doesn't exist. StockX is a, it's a marketplace. Uh, in a lot of ways, like eBay, we connect buyers and sellers. Uh, but the way that we connect buyers and sellers is completely unique. It is exactly the same way that the world's stock markets connect buyers and sellers. And today we do that for four products. We do that for sneakers, streetwear, handbags, and watches. So when you say you compare it to a stock market, you're talking about typical, I buy Apple stock, I buy Uber stock. I buy commodities, but you're doing it for products that have a resale value, right? At a starting point, that's absolutely right. Uh -huh. right? Um, we're doing this not as an investment necessarily, although you could absolutely use this to invest in certain products that have resale value, like Air Jordans or Yeezys. Mm -hmm. right? But theoretically, it works for almost any product that you could think of. Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't work for something that is a unique one-of-a-kind item, like a work of art. Um, a, a car, mm -hmm. um, a house, nothing, there's no market for a one of one, but anything that has some finite supply, mm -hmm. right? Which is to say, it doesn't work for toilet paper that has infinite supply. Right. But anything that's finite supply, which is almost any commercial good, mm -hmm. right? The, the hoodie you're wearing, right? The, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the sweater you buy at the store, it works for that because that is what the stock market is all about. The stock market is about understanding what that supply is of that product. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I assume you're very data-driven in your background. Are you a sneakerhead first or a data guy first? I love that you asked this question um, because on the surface, I think a lot of people do see me as maybe a data guy first or, or an IBM guy because it stands out on my resume. I just turned 40. I have the exact same story as every other 40-year-old sneakerhead, which is I grew up playing basketball when Jordan played. I always wanted Air Jordans. My mother would never buy me Air Jordans. As soon as I got some money, I bought Air Jordans, right? <laughs> I've been collecting sneakers since I Everyone's was Everyone's got that story, yeah. Literally, it's the exact same story, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? I mean, anyone... Which Air Jordan age. was the one that did it for you? Uh, Jordan 5 Grape. Um, okay. When I was, uh, I was at camp, and I remember seeing someone wearing... And it was purple, and I was like, what the fuck mm -hmm. is that? And I came home from camp, and I was like, I absolutely have to have this. And my mother was like, 125 hours, no way, you know, mm -hmm. get out of here. We used to go to um, this discount store called John's that was um, in a... It was like all the shoes were in plastic bags. Like shrink-wrapped? No, 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 like not even that. Almost like a like a 
like a not even shrink racks, like like literally like a plastic bag, like you would put fish in or something like that, right? <laughs> That's how they displayed the shoes. Yeah, and it was all, and they were all stuck in the racks, right? So you'd pull them out, look, and they were all like twenty nine. It was twenty nine dollars yeah. a pair, and like if you pulled them all out, you might be able to find like you know an old uh-huh. pair of Nikes or something like there. I actually have a pair of Brooks. That I still have, uh, that I like once pulled out from there. But that's how we used to get our shoes. And then as I got a little bit older and I started playing basketball, you know, you get like one pair a year. But like the Nike Air Maestro, like I still have that from like my junior year. But no, I, I mean I've collected sneakers probably since I was, you know, ten, twelve years old. Mm-hmm. And um, and and shit, I didn't actually do any real data work until I went to work for IBM. So growing up, you weren't like a natural born quant. No, I was a natural born entrepreneur though. Um, I've started to run three other startups before StockX, mm-hmm. and we can talk about some of those. But um, uh, you know, who Gary Vaynerchuk is. Yeah. All right. So the first time I ever met Gary Vaynerchuk, first of all, it was one of the most intense conversations of my life. We sat at like this tiny little like uh, like lunch counter in New York, this tiny little place, this close to each other, like face to face, and it was like. It was 20 minutes. We got like an hour and a half worth of conversation, 20 minutes. But the very first conversation he asked me was, baseball card or candy? And I was like, actually both. Uh And when I was in sixth grade, I sold chewing gum. Uh, When I was in ninth grade, I sold uh, blow pops. Mm -hmm. And I collected baseball cards all growing up until about 92, 93, where, you know, you shift from like baseball cards to like, you know, girls and whatever else you do when you're, you know, a junior in high school. But um, so I was an entrepreneur from a very early age um, before that word really existed. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it was sort of just a natural growth. and, And data just became one of those notches as you start to build different skill sets around being an entrepreneur. Were you really good at math? I was. Uh, I was definitely really good at math, um, and I was really bad. I was like uh, like 800, 500 on SATs for uh-huh. math, English, so the split. I was so I was definitely a math guy. When he when he asked you baseball card or candy, what did he? What was he trying to get out of you at that? He was trying to understand whether that I was, um, you know, a core you know entrepreneur. Whether mm-hmm. it's been something that's in my blood for forever, or whether you know you're you know new to the game and you're just trying to do something and which is fine and not that people can't do that but like again it's around age you know Gary's about four or five years older than me at our age like if you were a male entrepreneur at our age you probably were in like you probably did one or the other was selling uh, baseball cards or trading baseball cards or selling candy Mm -hmm. because those were the two sort of natural hustles for a a 10 year old kid in in 1988 Right. right And it's and true. so that and that's totally what it was. And it yeah. was like I looked at him and I paused for a second because and I knew exactly what he was talking about. Yeah. And it was actually both. For, for me, me, it was comics, which is the same vein as hundred like, percent. Yeah, baseball cards. Hundred percent. Yep. yep. Tried to start a store out of my garage, re, like pricing little comic books and stuff. Yeah. 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 And and uh, you know, for baseball cards, it was Beckett. Was there some version of that? Was a, a price guide for comics? Uh, yeah, I think it is Beckett's actually. Beckett did comics yeah, also. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. You had baseball cards, you had Beckett's, so you understood this this idea that like some cards were worth more than the other, right? Which is a very simple supply and demand idea. When did you start to feel like this could be applied to other things that didn't have that Beckett's guidebook? Yeah, so from a, a sneaker perspective, um, I was on the outside looking in uh, all my life. Um, I started three other businesses before StockX. None of them had anything to do with sneakers, Mm -hmm. almost intentionally so, almost like intentionally separating business and pleasure out of my life because I didn't want to create a business that was an excuse to play with sneakers, right? Kind of like the way that guys who wanted to create a comic book store or a baseball card store just because they always wanted to be around baseball cards. I was sort of weary of that because I... I Because you loved sneakers so much. Right, and and so it it almost seemed like I should separate those. And so, um, so it was purely as a consumer... Um, going through and buying shoes on eBay mm-hmm. and not having access to, I was like, well, what does this actually sell for? Mm-hmm. You know, it's really hard to tell on eBay what something's actually selling for because if you think about it, anything that's sitting there on eBay has probably been sitting there a while and so it's therefore overpriced because mm-hmm. if it was a good price, someone would buy it right away. Yeah. So it's really hard to figure out what's a fair price. Mm-hmm. And what had happened was I had shut down my last startup in the crash of 08, 09. And I moved to New York. I, I grew up in Philadelphia. I lived in Atlanta for 15 years. And I moved to New York to take a job at IBM, mm-hmm. which I never thought I would do. And that's a whole other long story. <laughs> but if you're a startup guy and you go take a big job at a, a, a big corporation, the first thing you do is you start working on shit on the side. Because the working at the man is like 
draining, right? It, like, not only is it draining, it, but it is like you don't. It doesn't consume you the way a startup does. Yeah. Right. So I'd come home and it's like I don't want to work on IBM shit, but like you have this. So it had to be something to do mm-hmm. working on the side. And what happened was I went to IBM and I very quickly went from I thought I knew a lot about data to well, now I'm a freaking expert because you have to be. Because yeah. you get thrown in the deep end, you're doing all this data work as a consultant. And so it was very coincidental timing. All this was happening right around uh, February of, 20, uh, of 2012. Okay. And February 2012 was Galaxy Foam release and All Star. And I'm living in New York mm-hmm. and going through this of this sort of this hyper uh, laser that had come down into the sneaker world for the first time in a long time where there's riots and now uh, news coverage the same way they did back in 91 with, mm-hmm. you know, your sneakers or your life. So there was all this, there was this new lens into the sneaker world making it a little bit more mainstream combined with like, well, what the fuck is it? Is the Galaxy Foam Pod actually, Foam Pods it actually worth? Right. People were, remember the guy was like, I'm selling my car and trading it for, I mean, it was yeah. like, it was nuts. Yeah. And so that, it, there was those two, th- those two things came together and it was, mm-hmm. well, I wonder if I get a hold of some sneaker data just to play with my own amusement, just to kind of see what I could do with it because this was going on all around me. I was doing this data work at IBM. All this was happening. Right. And so that was the impetus. Can okay. I get a hold of some sneaker data just to play with my own amusement? Yeah. And th- were you selling shoes ever on eBay? I've sold a handful of pairs. Okay. You know, I've never been uh, much of a reseller. I'm usually just buying them and keeping them yeah. um, for, you know, for whatever it's worth, right? I've been fortunate to have um relative to my age decent job and a decent amount of disposable income Mm -hmm. that um that you know i didn't really need to flip shoes in order to pay for my shoes once i started working right right when and earlier it was you know sort of begging your mom but Mm -hmm. like once i started working like the first thing i did was i I went to the mall and bought a pair of jordan it's like you know well if you've ever tried to sell shoes on ebay you'll know that like you've you've had that feeling where you're just like if you had a bad day, you might just charge something differently than on another day, right? You you do do some, like, quantitative research. You see what other people are selling for. But at the end of the day, you're like, fuck that. I think I could get twice as much. And you, there's a kid that's just, like, $50,000 for a pair of phones because he feels like he could get some idiot, right, a sucker. So that obviously frustrated you to see, like, this fluctuation in price on an hour-to-hour basis. And not only that, but your your point is exactly right that, a lot of sellers on eBay will take the position of, I'm going to put it out here, and someone's going to come along and eventually pay my price. It is a seller's market on eBay. Yeah. Right? Because as a buyer, you don't have visibility into where else this shoe might be selling for, and it might be hard to find it. Right. Particularly if you're dealing with a shoe more than like a year too old. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's really interesting to, to see that play out on eBay. Mm-hmm. And so again, it was it was really just sort of personal curiosity in the beginning. Yeah. Um, and knowing that eBay was the largest resale marketplace at the time, mm-hmm. there was an easy way to collect eBay data. And that's, we went down this path, and I'm not a technologist at all, but I recruited one of my former startup partners on the technology side to help me figure out how to collect eBay data. Okay. And if you've ever seen an eBay uh, auction or an eBay link on a sneaker blog, right, that is part of eBay's affiliate marketing program. Mm-hmm. And so you go on whatever nice kicks and you'll click that link and it'll take you to ebay and if you buy something right nice kicks gets a gets a affiliate fee yeah that same function right as opposed to taking that auction and just dropping it onto a website you can take that auction and just drop it into a database okay so it was actually really easy from a technology standpoint to be able to collect ebay auctions and so my Re- like really easy like you don't even have to ask ebay for it so it's it's really easy if you so it was just short of me being able to do it, right? So my former partner on the technology side, from his point, it was super easy, okay. right, to be able to tap into eBay's API and build it. eBay has a uh, terms of service, and their API is open for for certain reasons, mm-hmm. right? So you're allowed to collect it. What you're allowed to do with it, that's a different question. And was what right? you were doing with it sort of gray? Sort of gray is a very good way to put it. <laughs> it's a very positive way um, of putting it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the reality is that... Um, uh, what I was doing with it, um, they were okay with because I was driving everything back to eBay. Mm-hmm. So ultimately what Campless was, and the, the company we created was called Campless, which was a, a sneaker price guide. Before it became StockX, it was a, a sneaker price guide, and then we would just drive people back to eBay for mm-hmm. affiliate links. Mm-hmm. So eBay was really okay with it, even though we were 
creating data out of it that maybe was a gray area. Yeah. Ultimately, because we were driving people back to eBay, right. they, they were okay with so it. So Campless, this previous business, was really like, if you've ever tried to buy a car, there's the Kelly Blue Book, or as you said, the Beckett's baseball card price guide. Campless was a price guide only. Now you know the price, you still gotta go out and find it somewhere for that price, right? That's all it was. 100%. Okay. Right? Campless was the Kelly Blue Book or Beckett for sneakers. Mm -hmm. Um, then we would have a link and people would take people back to eBay uh -huh. and they were still on their own to go buy it. And, and they were, were you making money through affiliate marketing dollars as well? Uh, yes, but nominal. Uh -huh. I, I mean, right, like the, the whole business was, you know, was, Tiny. it was, first of all, it was a, it was a side project. I was doing it on the side while working at IBM. Mm -hmm. We had a couple other volunteers who helped because they either love sneakers or they love data or they just wanted to be involved, like my brother. Um, but there was, no real, there was no real money in the company. We made a couple bucks. It paid for like the servers, and, and that was it. Um, but theoretically, I guess if we'd had millions and millions of, 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 uh, of viewers and traffic, we could have made real money. But you know, it was always around the data and just trying to do something fun with it. Yeah. I remember, though, in those campless days, there was a couple of times where like bigger blogs and media outlets would actually like cite you guys. Right, and um, and that was the the start of of building something bigger. Uh -huh. um, in the beginning, it was purely a price guide. Um, we created a blog to go with it that was kind of like Freakonomics for sneakers. What you like commentary on the market? Yeah, yeah. And was, some was commentary on the market. Um, some was trying to just create interesting storylines. There was one that people liked a lot. It was titled "Are Sneakers More Like Stocks or Drugs?" Mm -hmm. And sort of comparing the stock market and the drug trade and. And how do sneakers compare and contrast to, to both of those? Which one is um, it closer to, by the way? Uh, it's it's a lot closer. The the um, the people and the way they act is a lot closer to the drug trade, but the sneakers and the data is a lot closer to the stock market. Okay, so it's a hybrid. Uh, of yeah, it, it is a hybrid. <laughs> um, but but you're right. And so what had happened was because of some of these other interesting stories and because there was no one doing real analytics on the secondary market, we did start getting cited by other people. And mm -hmm. notwithstanding what some people may think about him, Matt Powell was the first person to, to link to us, to highlight us, to start talking about us on Twitter because he's a data guy and you know, he understood that there was some real work going on. And, and by the way, that was the, the reason we started the blog, because anybody can just put a number on a site and say, you know, a, a, a mm -hmm. whatever, Jordan 7 Bordeaux is worth $300. What, we did that first, and then no one really cared. because mm -hmm. anyone. Could, so then we said, well, you know, we need to, like, you know, it's like third grade math class. We need to, like, show our work. Yeah. And so then we started putting all the work in behind it, all the, like, the math mm -hmm. in it, which was over the head of, like, 99% of the people who could give a shit about what all, But at least it was like, oh... Like, there's some real work going into this, some real analytics, yeah. and it was a reason to build credibility in the site. Right, right. Um, did you ever try to get a job, like, in the sneaker world? Like, even in, like, retail or sales? Did you ever try to do that? In January of, 25th, January of 2016, um, I gave a presentation at uh, Nike. It was a leadership offsite at the Presidio. It was every leader from Jordan and from Nike, and they invited me to speak there because I had just done a TED Talk about sneakers. Okay. The first slide that I put up there was it was a it was a data slide. There were two columns, and the first column said the the, the title of the slide was um, years that Josh applied for a job at Nike, and on the left hand side was every year from 1995, the year I started college, until 2015, every single year, and then down the right column it just said yes, 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 yes. That was my opening slide. I literally like every single year. Like I applied for internships at Nike and jobs at Nike and and did you, you know, get them every I year? I've never got one never job got ever one. in in any of it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was great, and everyone in the room liked that a lot. And uh, and now I'm on the outside, but that was right. kind of what I meant. Like I've been trying I, to I've, get in. I've purely just been a consumer yeah. into this into this world, right. and you know, watching and reading all the sneaker blogs and following everyone on, on Twitter and everything else. And then in 2012 created campus and started to actually become part of this. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of people, like I was an outsider coming in. I was like this data IBM guy right. coming in. And I totally get why that might be the perception. But like I was like anyone else. I've been collecting sneakers since I was 10. Yeah, yeah.
With Campless, did you ever get calls from companies to like sort of offer insight and consult? Oh, 100%. Okay. Um, and in the beginning, it was very like strict under NDA. Like they did not want anyone to know that they were talking. About. In fact, so the, the Nike conversations were great in the beginning because the first conversation, no matter who it was at Nike or however I got introduced to them, the first conversation was, oh, wow, this is like really cool data. We should find a way to work together. And then the second conversation was, ooh, you know what, uh, this is the resale market, maybe I better talk to my boss. Mm-hmm. And then the third conversation was total silence, no returning emails, no returning phone calls, like, at all. And I get it. Like, I totally get it, you know, why that happened. And, like, it's taken- Well, explain why. Is there a taboo with the resale market at these brands? 100%, right? And this dates back to, right, 1985, mm-hmm. right? I mean, your first Jordans of, you know, for 33 years, Nikes have this very willful blindness policy towards a secondary market, right? Obviously, everything they do creates it. Obviously, you know, they benefit from the supply and demand policies that create lines in the resale market, et cetera. But, you know, there's been a really lot of bad PR associated with the resale market, right? right? 1991, Air Jordan on the cover of Sports Illustrated, right? Your money or your sneakers or your life. Yeah, with a gun, yeah. Right? I mean, we all remember that. Kids getting trampled. Right. And and so there's a Pigeon lot of dunk. reasons. <laughs> I'm sure I don't need to remind you about, you know, about yeah. some of the, the bad things that have happened. And that is what the mainstream world sees. And so it's created this policy where the brands have said, listen, oh, no, that's we not us. We're not, we're not a part of that, whatever. Right. It's only been in the last couple of years that they've started to own that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Because, by the way, I think the brands have done really good jobs to stem some of that, right? Nike move releases from midnight to 10 a.m. and then started going from first come, first serve to raffles. Mm-hmm. And like, so they've done good stuff to, to do that. Right. And so it's just a slow process to get those brands to appreciate the secondary market. They all realize it's not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. And then to figure out, should we work with them and then how? And that's fine. It's a long process. It's a long game. And there are some people at the brands that I'm sure you know are going to be old school forever mm-hmm. and are always going to think that, no, like, it should, and then there's other people who are like, no. Like, Embrace it. Yeah, yeah like, we, it should be forward thinking. It should be how, how should we work with them. Right. Um, when you were at, Cam- when you started Campless and you're doing Campless now, um, and then you're still working at IBM, what was the impetus to, to say, like, I'm going to stop doing this IBM day job thing? Dan Gilbert. Okay. Right. Explain uh, who Dan Gilbert yeah. is for the people who don't know. Yeah, so... Without, I mean, you could wiki search this really yeah. fast, but explain Dan. Uh, so um, Dan is most uh, notable for the owner being the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Mm-hmm. Um, his primary business and, and where um, he made uh, his money initially was from Quicken Loans. So okay. he's the founder and, and chairman of Quicken Loans, which just became the largest mortgage lender in the country. Is Quicken Loans also Quicken and QuickBooks? No. Okay. So that's a good question. Okay. Um, but um, it has a, a history together. So Dan originally created a mortgage company called Rock Financial um, in the late 90s. Dan basically invented online mortgages, mm-hmm. which is today a very common thing yeah. to think about. But you like see back, commercials for it all the time. But yeah. back in 1998, it was crazy to think that people would put all their financial information online to, to try to get a, a mortgage. Um, and so Dan created a company called Rock Financial. He sold it to Intuit, mm-hmm. which renamed it Quicken. Mm-hmm. Into it, ran it into the ground, and sold it back to Dan, mm-hmm. and basically licensed the name Quicken in perpetuity. So it's still called Quicken, but has nothing to do with Intuit or Quicken or, or QuickBooks anymore. Okay. Yep. All right. So um, Quick uh, Quicken Loans is the the flagship company. Yeah. The Cavs are the most notable, um, but there's about 130 other companies within the Quicken Loans family of companies, mm-hmm. um, including all different, not just financial mortgage stuff. That's right. There are some other mortgage companies. But there's also uh, a lot of real estate um, in Detroit, in Cleveland, and a few other cities. There are some casinos and gaming. There are other professional sports teams at the minor league level. Mm-hmm. And then there's a lot of startups, uh, StockX being one of them. Okay. So that's, that's Dan. Yeah, um, so Dan is uh, not a poor fellow. Dan is not a poor fellow. Okay. Um, and so he's on that Forbes list every year. He's on that Forbes list. And so you're saying you're working at IBM. You're fucking around with this campless data shit. Right, getting a few calls here and there from Nike, and then not getting calls back, and then all of a sudden, what happens? So it was uh, right before Easter of 2015, so coming up on almost three years, and uh, I get a totally random call, uh, email from two guys that say, "Hey, we work with Dan Gilbert. We're really interested in what you're doing. Can we talk?" Dan's got no ties to the sneaker industry, but yeah. sure, right? Talk to anybody. 
I get on the phone with these guys, and it's like word for word the exact same conversation I had a thousand times at that point. I didn't think anything of it. And then two days later, they call me back and they say, we definitely want to do this business. We definitely want to work with you. We'd like to fly you to Cleveland to go to a game and meet Dan. Well, first half that statement, it's like, well, whatever. Everybody says they're going to do shit, right? <laughs> Second half, I'm like, yeah, absolutely you can fly me to a game. No problem, right? Yeah. You know, of course. You You're know, still I, at IBM right now. I'm still at IBM. I'd moved from, I just had my first kid. Uh -huh. um, and I just moved from New York down to Philadelphia where I live. Okay. Right? So, and Campless is still not making... A no, ton of money. No, not making we're really no money. I mean, okay. it was it was purely a, a passion project okay. on the side. It, there was the thing was there was enough people using it, and there was enough interest, and people really liked it, and it was clearly had a very defined niche that no one else was playing in. So there was something there, but man, I I talked to everybody in the sneaker industry at that point: Nike, eBay, Foot Locker, Complex, yeah. like you name it. And there was never really a good fit of like who to work with or how to leave IBM and what to do. And for right. me, it was like, how do I leave IBM? What do you do with this thing? So in your head, this is still a hobby fully like just a hobby that it, you can't figure out a match for not only was it still a hobby it was it was a it was a hobby that had a finite window because my um my wife was was at this point like 39 weeks pregnant with our second kid mm -hmm. and up until this point um i had had two legit full-time jobs i mean two 60 hour plus week jobs for both of them and my wife had taken all the responsibility of my first kid off my plate you know i just got to kiss her and put her to bed like you know it was and I knew that there was no way that shit was going to fly once the second kid came. I didn't have to ask her, like... like It was let's, known, yeah. Yeah, like it was... Stop with the camp list, basically. Something was, something, <laughs> something was going to have to give, right? I had yeah. two jobs and one kid. I was about to... So, and, but literally, a week before that happened, uh -huh. um, you know, I get a, a call. A week before your second kid is born. Yeah, yeah. My, my wife's 39 weeks pregnant, and, um, and these guys call me up and invite me to a game in Cleveland. And, you know, so I'm... I didn't think really much of it from mm -hmm. a business standpoint. So I'm telling my wife, my friends, like, you know, I get to go to a game with the owner of the Cavs. Yes, yeah, that was the highlight. You get to go to a that game. That was the whole story, man. That's all I thought was coming out of this. And, you know, and these guys were like, you know, you know, I know it's short notice. Could he, could he come on Easter Sunday? First of all, I was like, I'm Jewish. Like, absolutely. Like, let's make this thing happen, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, I didn't tell Dan and those guys that my wife was pregnant, right? Uh -huh. But, like, the plan was fly in, go to the game that afternoon. It was like an Easter Sunday game. So it was like 3 p.m. And then fly right back home that night. Mm -hmm. So that was the plan. There's a long story here, but the short of it is that essentially we get there, um, we end up in a room together and talking to Dan about this idea I'd had about a stock market for sneakers. And the way that I was thinking about this was really super logical, was that if you knew the value of one pair of sneakers, you could very easily create sneaker portfolios. Right? Look at someone's whole sneaker collection the way you look at a stock portfolio. And then the logic in the data was like, well, if you knew asset pricing, if you knew portfolio pricing, then perhaps you could actually operate as a stock market. Mm -hmm. So it was very much sort of ground up being like, oh, this would work really well for sneakers because people already treat sneakers as assets the way that people buy and sell them and, and hold them and decide, are these Yeezys going to go up? Maybe I should hold them. Maybe I should sell them. Like, right. it, it was already happening. Did Dan understand that this was happening? So, so his thing. So okay. I pitched them this idea I had around a, a stock market for sneakers. And um, and then I'd had this like one piece of paper I had showed them that like had this idea on it, right? And they look at me, the three of them look at me, Dan and two guys, they look at me with pure shock. Uh -huh. And it doesn't register to me why. Uh -huh. And then one of them takes a piece of paper out and he's like, yeah, we have one of those. That is exactly what we want to build, a stock market for sneakers. So wait, and one I was of these like, guys takes out a piece of paper that's almost identical to like your piece of paper in terms of a plan. Yeah. Yeah. That had literally the <laughs> same idea it was like the, the core part of it was a stock market for sneakers. Uh -huh. And I was like, holy shit, right? Because, <laughs> like, I, I, by the way, I'd taken that piece of paper to Nike, eBay, Foot Locker, Complex, like everybody. Mm -hmm. And everybody had said, oh, that's pretty cool. But we want to do is this, right? Mm -hmm. We want to take your data and do X, Y, and Z in our business. Right. And fair enough. I yeah. knew Nike was going to change our whole business, build a stock market. Yeah. These guys, you know, I, I later found out that Dan's always had this much bigger idea around a stock market of things that you could buy or sell anything the same way that the stock market works. Mm -hmm. And then he happens to see his 15-year-old son buying and selling sneakers on eBay. Okay. Like every other 15-year-old kid. Right. And he took a closer look at that and said, that's a pretty crappy market leader, eBay, and that'd be a perfect place to start a stock market. Uh -huh. So Dan actually goes out and he puts together a team independently to start working on a sneaker stock market. Mm -hmm. And those guys got a week, two weeks into it and realized, well, crap, we need a sneaker guy, right? Mm -hmm. Who's a sneaker guy that's going to run the sneaker stock market? Yeah. So they go out, they do some research, they find campus, they find me. Turns out the sneaker guy is also trying to build a sneaker stock market, right? right? Is also ran through other companies and worked for right. IBM and wasn't like a random guy. Yeah. So it's this really crazy serendipity of like everything they were looking for and everything I was looking for. So. When you went into this, um, I'll go ahead, drink. 
Let me, oh. Yeah, let me let me get a swig too. So when you're preparing to go to Cleveland for this game, right? Were you thinking Shark Tank elevator pitch? Like I'm gonna I'm gonna rent a, a suit and like put on a tie and put some loafers on. This is Dan Gilbert. Like this is my moment. No, no, not really. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I. When you've been doing something and you're as into it, right? I've been doing, I was at that point, I was on campus for three years, Mm -hmm. right? Like, I knew this inside and out, like, I lived it. Yeah. Um, And, you know, the other part of it was, you know, as a startup guy, you know, I was like, look, I'm going to show up and, like, I am who I am. And my wife convinced me to, um, to, like, wear a button down shirt, but I was still wearing, I was wearing, I, I wore Tiffany Dunks and I took a pair of LeBrons with me and, um, and I was wearing jeans and a button down shirt and I was wearing this hat. Which I'm wearing a, a gray skull cap. A, a gray skull cap down to your eyebrows. Yeah. And I was wearing this hat and I walked in off, because I was walked in off the street, so I was still wearing this. And the first thing that Dan Gilbert ever said to me, ever, was he was like, I bet you're the only guy at IBM that wears a hat like that. And I was like, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Like, you know? <laughs> and what's crazy, and as you've seen Detroit now and you've seen the family of companies, from the top down, Dan is all about like just being yourself and your own personality. And, like, honestly, if I had walked in there wearing a suit, I think they probably would have seen right through that and mm-hmm. been like, you know, this guy is trying to be something he's not and, and work through that. And, were they in suits? Yeah. Um, Dan usually wears a blazer to home games. The other two guys were wearing, like, jeans and a button-down. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, like, top-down is one of the really great things about this, and I know a lot of people have seen, a, at least when I, any public appearances these days, I'm usually wearing a, a Tiger's hat backwards. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's what it's like working around here. Like, yeah. I'll be in a meeting with Dan and Warren Buffett where the Tigers hat backwards. Like, that's mm-hmm. just, you know. Right. Um, and you go into the meeting with this one sheet. Mm-hmm. Just in ca- It's like a just-in-case thing, right? Because you don't know what to expect. No idea. You don't know if you're going to get, like, a video presentation or a PowerPoint. So you just, like, make a one-sheet piece of paper that you're going to bring. It's literally folded up in my pocket. <laughs> it's, like, folded <laughs> into fours and, like, in my pocket. And then... The conversation propels to a place where you feel like, I'm going to pull this idea out. And yeah. do you ever think, like, if you played this meeting the wrong way, it could have gone totally different? Like, what if you went in with, like, an easel and, like, a 20-page PowerPoint? How would it have gone? Well, first of all, we were meeting at the Cavs game, so it was yeah. pretty hard to bring an easel into the Cavs game, right? Yeah, yeah but some people would have gone yeah. OD on it. You know, some people would have gone crazy overboard. Yeah, no, it's true. I, I let my wife convince me to wear a button down as opposed to... Uh, that was the only thing. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, all right, it's fair enough. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, look, I, it's <laughs> funny. I later found out um, that when... I later found out that when they, they found Campus... Um, honestly, the way they originally found Campus was because they were trying to size the market and understand, is this something they should go after? And I was the only one who had sized the resale market. Yeah. Um, would just, it just sort of come out that the resale market was worth over a billion dollars, and, and it got a lot of press. Um, so, um, so anyway, so as, as I'm thinking about um, you know, going into this meeting, I, I lived it. It was like I, I, there was no other way to do this than like just the 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 way that I, I existed. Right. Right. But was really interesting. And to your point, so I later found out these guys did the research. They found campus. They found me. They went out. They looked on LinkedIn and they saw I was a JD MBA. Right. I have a JD MBA from Emory and IBM. And they were like, Oh, this guy's way too corporate for us. <laughs> right? That was their initial thought. Yeah, the need a sneaker guy, not right. this guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that yeah. I was way too corporate for them, right? And then I walk in wearing a skull cap and, oh, you know, and you all made this the right and move. sneakers, right? That And it was funny because there's there's not a lot of people, like, in, within Dan's <laughs> inner circle that are, like, MBAs or whatever. Like, Dan's much more of a real world guy than, yeah. than an academic guy and, uh-huh. and absolutely values, like, you know, the grit versus the... Um, the brains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, it turns out that uh, that I played it right. But, yeah, I guess if I had yeah. – I mean, I think if I had worn a suit, that meeting would have gone way different. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, so were you th- you leave the meeting. You go back home to your wife, right? So not quite. So, okay, so here's so what happened. Okay, so, here's so this, what this is the best part. So what happens is – Because you're supposed is, to be there Sunday and go home. I was supposed to fly right home that night. So what happens is we sit there and – it's very clear in this meeting that there's this crazy serendipity that, like, you know, everything they were looking for and everything I was looking for, and all this is happening literally in the locker room at the Cavs game on Easter Sunday. So, so at this point, Dan's like, well, you got to come out to Detroit to see everything and meet everyone. And, um, and it was Sunday. So I was like, oh, well, my week's pretty light this week at IBM. I'm sure I could come whenever. 
So his assistant looks at his phone. He's like, how about like Tuesday or Wednesday? Dan's like, put your phone away. Why don't you just come back with us right now? And I was like, uh, okay. So like I text my wife, please don't go into labor. I text IBM, not sure if it'll work tomorrow, sorry. So we, so we fly Wait, from- you had to, hold on. Let me just, you had to be at work the next morning uh-huh. at IBM. You have a wife who's about to burst any second. Mm-hmm. You have a billionaire saying, come back to my office right now. Those are some hard ass fucking decisions to make right there on the spot. IBM was an easy one, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Fine. IBM was an easy one. Okay. And like, you know, my wife's been pretty supportive and uh, we already had one kid. So, I, you know, it was the worst. I don't know. It, it just, you know, it was you all. follow it, him back to Detroit. Uh, I, 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 I rode with him back on, on his plane, back to Detroit. Right there. Yeah. We, um, we, I literally, we packed up, we went right to the, to the airport and, and, and flew with him, which was great because I got to spend a lot of time talking with him. Um, we get back to Detroit, spent all day uh, in Detroit on Monday, the, the tour that you went on, yeah. the tour, meeting lots of different people, different parts of, of, of the business. Um, Monday well, okay, pause right here. Mm-hmm. I, I, gotta, I gotta interlude here and say that we both have a commonality. We both play poker. Yep. Okay. So if you play any poker, you'll know that there's tells and they're showing your hand without having to show your actual cards, right? So now here you are, you just pulled out your one sheet of ideas of this freaking pet project that you've been working on for four years now, right? And now he's saying, fly on my private plane back to me to my headquarters. What's the poker player Josh saying now? Are you like, yo, we we got a deal. Are you trying to play it mad cool? Like inside, it must have been fucking like fireworks in your body. So yes, uh-huh. talk right. well, about first, what was going on in your in your body, like in your head, what was going on? Well, in my head, everything's going. There's a million things going through your head. Yeah, right. Like, don't fuck up, right? Don't screw this up. Well, honestly, like <laughs> honestly, at that point, I was still on a, a really a, a really just su- some combination of surprise and, and high. Okay. Right, because here's the thing: I've been doing this for three years, and then I talked to everybody no in the one secret really, industry. Yeah, no one really supported. No, no, no one it. even like really got it, right? And let alone was like, "Yeah, I want to do this." And it was like, "Holy shit! This guy literally is trying to do the exact same thing that I'm trying to do." Like, what? First of all, like the fact that there was one other guy in the whole world trying to do the exact same thing, and then it happens to be one of the most successful business people in the world, right? That would be like, the part that the scares fuck? the shit out of me. Yeah, well, I, I, I wasn't even at the scared part yet because it was still so incredulous this was going on. Because here's the, first of all, Dan's got no ties to sneaker industry. Mm-hmm. It's been three years and I can't even get him to wear sneakers, right? But like, you know, he's always had this bigger idea and it was this very, it was just the whole thing was just very serendipitous. Yeah. And so I was just rolling with it. And it was yeah. like, we're just gonna, gonna roll with it. And in retrospect, the way that I handled the trip was also I don't I don't think on their part it was an intentional test, but it was absolutely a test from from navigating this environment and working here because working with Dan is ninety five percent just unbelievable and a dream and you like it's just phenomenal, and then five percent just fucking kill yourself, right? Because he still runs one hundred and thirty other companies, yeah. Right? And to be able to to get his attention when you need it and mm-hmm. you know and whatever it is, right? It, there's a lot of of that, yeah. And you'll take that. 100 times out of 100, right? Mm-hmm. Take that ratio. Um, but it, it's crazy. And I never could have imagined all the different things that came out of this, including things like having Eminem as an investor and, and the way that we, you know, Mark Wahlberg and Dan were friends, which is how Mark ends up becoming an investor. And like all the things that have come because of, of the environment. The yeah. and, that, and the way that trip played out, a lot of it I think was, um, was I think on their end, you know, sort of knew that, that I was the right person because – I was just like, well, let's just roll with it. You yeah. know, I was like, we've gotten this far. So like, there, there was no way when he invited me that I was going to say, no, I got to go back. And, uh, you know, and uh, my <laughs> wife, no. I, one of the two guys who was there knew that my wife was pregnant. Uh-huh. And Dan didn't. And I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to interrupt this thing and tell him. Yeah. Um, but See, that's a, that's a poker move right there. Because you, you knew that yeah. you knew that by injecting the pregnancy and urgency of your wife, it would have changed the dynamic of the relationship. Dan would have said, "Like you need to go home." Yep. He probably would have given he, you the plane to go home. Well, I don't know what that. He definitely would have made me go home. Yeah. And now knowing him today, yeah, he, he would have. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> what? So so what happens is so we go back. Yeah. We, we tour the whole city um, on the first day. Uh, Monday afternoon, back in Dan's office, mm-hmm. um, he says, "Hey, listen, you know, we'd really like you to stay another day to keep talking." And I was like. Sure, why not, right? I text my wife, I'm like, please don't fucking kill me, right? I text IBM, not show up at work, you know? I literally wore the same clothes for three days straight, yeah. right? 
I thought I was going there and going right home. Yeah. Right? Um, finally, end of the day, Tuesday, back in Dan's office, and he's like, listen, we all agree we think this is the right fit. Um, we want to buy campus. We want you to come here and run the company. And they finally let me go home. I get home at like 1 a.m. on Tuesday night, and my wife's waiting up for me. And I walk in. I was like, yo, I think we're moving to Detroit. And she's like, what the hell? I thought you went to Cleveland. <laughs> right? She thinks like you're on a like a rager right yeah. now. Like, what? you know, it's like I was like, ah, I might I might have like forgotten to mention that we flew to Detroit. Um, but you know, it was funny. I was actually and on my way out the door Tuesday after they had kidnapped me for like three days. Mm-hmm. Um, at that point, someone had back channeled that my wife was pregnant. He ran after me and he was like, hey, hey. He's like, hurt, and he gave me a stack of like like calves onesies and other stuff like for the kid. And fortunately, my son wasn't born for another eight days. <laughs> so it worked out okay. Um, but yeah, the whole thing was was interesting. And, and the honestly, though, the, the real poker um, comes into place from after that, right? Because what happened from there was mm-hmm. Dan saying, we'd like to buy Campless. Yeah. And then I actually had to negotiate that deal. Right. Because you didn't right. sign a document no. right then and there that week. It was like, let's start this discussion. How long did it take from the say from saying, we want to buy Campless to signing? Um, yeah, so... That was Easter, um, so it's like mid-April, and, um, and we signed a deal on, um, we shook hands on June 3rd. Two months. So, yeah. In my experience, yeah. that's actually really fast. It was really fast. Now, um, there, was, there was still legal stuff that we had to work through after that, mm-hmm. um, but in terms of, uh, and, and by the way, most of that time was me waiting for Dan, and so here's the thing, this is, and fortunately we were apart, I was in Philadelphia and he was in uh, Detroit, because what would happen was, he would send an offer. I would very studiously and, and professionally send a counter offer within 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And then I'd wait. And then I'd wait. And I'm literally like refreshing my phone like every four minutes totally. for like, like a week. Yeah. Right? And like in my mind, you know, every minute, every day that goes by, you know, all the things go through your head. I'm like, what? I fucked up. And the reality is like, he still has 130 other companies to mm-hmm. run, and you know, and and his guys who are working with him were like, "Don't read anything that's into him." You know, it's just hard to get stuff back in front of him, and da And like now, I, I see that, and yeah. like, fair enough. But it right. doesn't change the fact that I refresh my phone every four <laughs> minutes for a week and a half, <laughs> right. right? Like, right. And then I'm, so, I'm surprised yeah. you even had the balls to go back and like, how many times did you have to counter? Um, so we did. We went two rounds, uh-huh. and then on the third, they came back and they basically did not come back with a third and said something like, maybe we should just wait. And then I was like, fuck. And I was like, listen. And this was to, like, to his guys who were sort of managing. I said, listen. I said, can you just get me in a room with Dan? I was like, if you get me in the room with Dan, we can get this deal done, mm-hmm. right? And this was like on a, on a Friday. Or it was like a Thursday. It was a Thursday. And they said, all right. They're like, da-da-da. They came back to me a little bit later. They're like, Tuesday, mm-hmm. right? Like, if you can come up Tuesday and do this. By the way, this time, they're not offering to pay for my flight. They're not offering yeah. to pay for a hotel. There was nothing, right? right? There was like, yeah, if you want to come meet with Dan on Tuesday, Persona you can meet with Persona non grata. Yep. No more private. <laughs> yeah, the, the negotiations had changed drastically. Yeah. Um, so I fly myself up there on Tuesday. I book my hotel room. Right. I get there. Uh, 8 a.m., I'm meeting with, like, his guys. We're having, like, breakfast. And I have no idea whether they even want to make a deal. At this yeah. point, I'm like, do you guys want to do this or not? Like, am I going in there and he's just going to tell me to fuck off? Like, what? Yeah. And they're like, no, no, we definitely want to do this. I was like, okay. And so the meeting was set for like 1 p.m. So, you know, we hung out and did some stuff during the day. Uh, 12.45 comes around. They're like, Dan can't meet until 3. Okay, fine. So we do some stuff, right? 3 o'clock comes. Dan can't meet until 4. Okay. He can't meet until 5. It, this was the first game of the Atlanta Hawks playoff series in Atlanta. And I knew Dan had to leave at 5.30 for mm-hmm. the game, mm-hmm. right? So it's five, meeting's supposed to be at 5 p.m. He's supposed to leave at 5.30 for the game, right? I'm waiting outside his office. I'm waiting outside his office. 5 o'clock, he's not there. 5.10, he's not there. 5.15, he's not there. 5, like, five like 20, he gets in his office. He pulls in his guys for two minutes. So I go in there at, like, 5.22, right? And um, He has to have a 5.30. You know you have eight minutes to something like that, seal right? this deal. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so I walk in, and as I'm walking in, before I sit down, making conversation, I said, How's Kyrie's leg? Kyrie had, or how's Kyrie's foot? Kyrie had hurt his foot in the last round. I got seven minutes on everything you ever want to know about a foot injury. I'm like, what? <laughs> he just goes in on Kyrie's foot. And then you we were hoping it'd be like 30 seconds yeah, yeah, of, like of, of, him saying, of him saying, yeah, no, it's, it's fine. He's right. going to be good. You know? and, and then we got the deal done literally in like one minute. And he sat down and we were, we were close enough. You know, and yeah. he, he definitely he wanted to get it done, and uh-huh. um, and we were able to get it done. We both made a few concessions, and we got it done at the highest level, right? 
And what was best was, you know, he was like, let's walk out there and tell them all we couldn't reach a deal. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Sure? So, like, I had to pretend like I wasn't, like, on cloud nine. Right. And I was like, uh, yeah. And then, like, fortunately, he broke really soon. And I was like, yeah, that was fine. And that was great. And we were all, I was all happy. I um, literally, like, five minutes later, I went in the other room. I called IBM. I gave my notice. And, um, and I went back to Philadelphia. And then uh, that next Monday, four, five days from then, whatever, Monday through Friday, every week for the next um, like four or five months, I was flying from Philly to Detroit, mm-hmm. um, starting to work on StockX and, uh, and looking for a home and eventually moved my wife and family here. But um, literally from the, the next day, you know, that next week, we were trying to, to take Campus, what it was, and turn it into StockX. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's an incredible story. <laughs> I mean, you were still working at IBM at the time. So you're negotiating this deal. You're countering this negotiation. But at the same time, you knew that your alternate was just going back and working at <laughs> IBM. Like, <laughs> what leg did you think you had to stand on negotiating with this billionaire? I, I have no idea. Um, I have no idea except for the only thing was I just – I didn't think that they would just walk away, uh-huh. right? Like, worst case is, like, you go back with your tail between your legs and you take, like, you know, one yeah. of, like a lower offer or mm-hmm. whatever – but like you know, if you as long as you handle it professionally and you know and make counter offers that are you know educated and have some basis Sensible, of reality yeah. and not just be like an asshole about it, mm-hmm. like you can kind of go back to at least the last offer, you know, and, and sure you might lose a little you know face or whatever. But so it, you know, it was always that, uh, and I wasn't I wasn't being unreasonable. Mm-hmm. Like in retrospect, like. Could I maybe have gotten a little bit more? Maybe, mm-hmm. right? You know, could I, would I maybe agree to a little bit less? Sure, like yeah. absolutely. You know what I mean? So like it was, it was still being somewhat reasonable in the negotiation that you know I was like I was just really careful not I wasn't going to burn any bridges. Yeah, right. yeah. Was it a deal where and I don't know if you want to disclose numbers, but was it a deal where they bought Campus and put you on a like sort of salary and equity still in the new company? Yeah. So um, yeah. So. So they they bought Dan bought Campus, mm-hmm. and then we became equity partners in StockX mm-hmm. in turning Campus into StockX. Mm-hmm. And so as the CEO of uh, StockX, I have a salary, and as uh, as a co-founder with Dan um, and Greg Schwartz, who you met, who's the COO, um, we all have equity in StockX as well. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. So it was a, it's a heavy negotiation because you've got the buyout of your company, you, a salary package. And then equity in this new company as well. So there's like three levers that you're sort of juggling in the air. Right. It, yeah. it, it manifests itself into two separate um, contracts. There's a sale, there's mm-hmm. a purchase and sale agreement, and then there's an employment contract. Mm-hmm. Of, the, of the three, when you were going back and forth, which was the ones that you were sort of like going back on? The, the the one that you have the most leg to negotiate in that point is the sale of the company because there's a, there's a way to... Um, to value it and it's the asset you have. The hardest part about this, and the hardest part for any entrepreneur starting a company and dealing with equity with co-founders, is it's really hard to figure out, um, you know, it's really hard just to figure out equity in a startup in the best of circumstances. Yeah. And this was a very, very unusual circumstance where you're going into business with a billionaire who not only he was gonna be a co-founder and he was gonna be the investor. So mm-hmm. he kind of has two legs in that Pie. And he's bringing a ton to the table. That's right, and his whole his whole ecosystem and, and the credibility and everything else that goes along. So it's a really it's a really complicated situation under the best of circumstances, but also at the same time trying to negotiate the sale of the company. Um, you know, it's like I, I kind of I've kind of put most of my focus into the sale of the company because that was. I just understood that dynamic a lot better. The other one was this sort of black box yeah. that we sort of went into it with the best intentions, and the, and the reality is of that um, is that um, Dan is is a just a phenomenal partner and, and, and person. And as the company has grown, um, we've been able to make sure that everything is, is fair and the way it should be mm-hmm. because we all went into it and no idea what it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Incredible, yeah. Um, you did a pretty infamous TED Talk. Was that before or after this? In the middle. <laughs> in the it middle. was in the middle of this yeah. negotiation. It, no, so it was one in the, in the middle of negotiation, in the middle of, of Campus and StockX. So... Um, but actually, it was kind of in the middle of the negotiation. So the way it happened was... And I suggest, for you listening, if you haven't seen it, you should Google this TED Talk. It's really, really informative and amazing. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I was working at IBM, and I was doing campus on the side. And um, the IBM marketing team came to me and said, we are doing a TED event, 
and it was uh, it was like Big Ted, you know, there's like Big Ted and there's TEDx, right? Yeah, the so main it, stage TED. Yeah, yeah. They're like, we're doing a, a TED event, and we'd like you to apply to speak at it. Mm-hmm. We know you're doing this. You know, everyone at IBM knew what I was doing. Okay. Like, there was no trying to hide it, and it was not competitive with IBM, and I still did my job well at IBM, right? So, so they knew, and so they asked me to apply, um, and then I applied, and then I was in TED World, and, uh, and I was accepted to, to do this presentation as part of the IBM TED event. Um, and then in between the time that I was accepted and the event, all of this happened. Mm-hmm. And I leave IBM, and I go start working with Dan. And so then I get to on the other side of that negotiation, and I'm now firmly there. And then I call back to IBM Marketing and Ted and say, hey, listen, I left IBM. Can I still do this? And, wow. and, and IBM was like... You know, Ted had already accepted me, so they were kind of like, we don't care, like, you're here yeah. now. And IBM was like, yeah, you're an IBM alum, great, no problem. Nice. So they all were happy for me, and the time was phenomenal because the TED Talk was in October of 2015, mm-hmm. and we launched StockX in February of 2016. So it was, we had been working on StockX long enough that I was able to tease some of the concepts, so I kind of ended the TED Talk with stock market of things. You know, what if there was a stock market of things? In TED World, you can't talk about brand, you can't talk about the company, but the big idea. And so Mm -hmm. it worked out perfectly to be able to tease this idea around a stock market of things, and then four months later to to launch StockX. So it was really just phenomenal time. Yeah, you couldn't have had a better platform to promote this thing on. But you also dropped some crazy knowledge that I think shocked a lot of people. And I think one of the ones and I don't know if the data is now old, and if you could remind me, but like you said something to the effect of the size of the resale market at that time. If it were a company, you said it would have been, I think, the second or third biggest company. What was it? Right. So I, so I know it's true. So, um, so at the time, um, Nike was number one and Skechers was number two. Mm-hmm. Um, we can all remember a time before Yeezy. Mm-hmm. Um, right, the, yeah. right. This was uh, at, this, at yeah. this point only two Easies had come out: the Turtle Dove and the original Seven Fifty Brown. So we were nowhere near what it is today, and, and Adidas was still sort of distant, distant third. Yeah. Skechers was actually the second largest um, company from a revenue standpoint in the United States, mm-hmm. and Nike was by and away first. This is our retail level, and so if you took the the resale market, which in the U.S. at that time was about one point two billion dollars. And Nike was about 97% of that, mm-hmm. right? So let's just call Nike a billion. Yeah. And let's say the profit in the resale market is, is a third. Let's mm-hmm. just say you may, So let's just call, on average, $300 million is what Nike's resale market share is, right? Yeah. That was bigger than Skecher's revenue. Mm-hmm. So what it was is the profit that kids were making on Nike was more than the second biggest retail sneaker yeah. in the United States. Now, Adidas has since... Totally past Skechers, got a lot closer to, to Nike. So that stat doesn't hold true anymore because of how well Adidas has done in the last three years. But it's but, still top five. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. It's still, it would be three. It would yeah. be three after, after Nike and Adidas. The, the profit that people are making on Nikes in the secondary market is bigger than, was bigger than any other sneaker company in the United States at the time. Yeah. It's crazy. And I think saying that on the TED stage was like, yeah. like a head explosion moment and you know what the the real head explosion moment was when i found that stat during it because i was researching that that general idea Mm -hmm. and i i checked that number like 40 times i was like this can't be right i was like this is fucking amazing Mm -hmm. and i and i was and i was like man this is unbelievable i checked it every which way because i you know i i I couldn't can't make up numbers and data and going in there but to have that come out and, and like make my point so clearly in the ted talk it was really great right and from that point it was just skyrocketing right yeah, there, I mean, and what it was great is because you know once Adidas and Yeezy and Pharrell and NMDs and everything else, yeah. you know, um, we haven't done a, a full estimate like a deep dive the way that that I did back in the day um, in a while. But like best guess right now is the resale sneaker market U.S. is probably creeping creeping up on maybe one point seven, one point eight billion, mm-hmm. um, and globally probably close to seven billion. Wow, so. and. I guess the success of Adidas and sort of other brands bubbling too only helps your business, right? It, it, it doesn't help that only Nike and Jordan are dominating the market. So, so that's true, mm-hmm. right? The um, you know the more the secondary market exists, the more shoes that are out there. It is better for StockX. Um, what's been interesting though is that Adidas grew the resale market, but not that much. They really just took a lot of share from Nike. 
from right. the inline people buying it at regular price in stores, that market. A little bit of that, and then also a little bit of the Nike resale market. So, I mean, think about Jordans today versus Jordan three years ago, right? Mm-hmm. Jordans are sitting on shelves at Foot Locker. Mm-hmm. Three years ago, that never happened, right? Yeah. And so we've seen some of that, is that Adidas is, has taken some of that secondary market from Nike. Yep. So their growth has grown the secondary market, but it's also just shifted some of it as well. Yeah. Um, you mentioned before that, like, with Dan Gilbert on board now, you have a connection to all these people that you wouldn't have any connection with. So who are some of these people that are now involved with StockX? Sure. Yeah, so we have some really prominent um, investors. And um, frankly, we never planned this. Mm -hmm. Um, We never said we should go out and get some of the most famous people involved. It happened very organically. Um, And the first one was with with Paul Rosenberg, who's Eminem's manager. And, um, you know, when we started this company, we sat literally right outside of Dan's office. And the reason why is because he was so personally invested in this. And what would happen was anybody that was meeting with Dan, it didn't matter who they were. They could be there about NBA or mortgages or it could be, you know, the, the mayor of, of Houston. It didn't matter. Anybody, he'd walk them out after the meeting and be like, oh, Josh, show them what we're working on, right? Because mm-hmm. he was just really excited about StockX. And one day, Paul Rosenberg was in the office um, talking to some people at about a music festival in Detroit. And, um, and that sort of connection was was struck and and you know i was paul's a sneaker head right well paul and m have done so many sneaker collaborations Mm -hmm. you know through the years um that you know they know that market really well and and so i was introduced to paul in that context and i shared it with him and and, you know he said oh he said we should get m involved in this and i was like yeah that sounds like a good (laughs) idea we should get him you know like what the fuck right (laughs) And, uh, and so that was the first, and, um, and it was great. And by the way, like, of all the people I've worked with at this point, you know, there's probably no one who's more professional and smarter and, and just in that space than Paul. And so he's been phenomenal, and we've been super lucky that he was sort of the first one for us to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously we've done some really cool stuff with Eminem. But um, it kind of grew from there. Um, the second one was we were in a meeting and uh, just randomly came up that Mark Wahlberg wears a lot of Jordans. Mm-hmm. Dan says, oh, I know Mark. Like an hour later, I'm on an email chain with Dan and Mark. Two days later, I'm at in Beverly Hills at Mark's house, going through a sneaker collection with him. And um, and you know, and, and Mark's like, "Hey, you know, it's like, can I get involved in the company?" And I was like, "Okay, okay, right." Like so, and then from there, we started doing it more strategically and thinking through it as as we met people. But it was really like M and Mark in the beginning, and it was really organic. Mm-hmm. And uh, and both those guys have been um, have been were just really super helpful in, yeah. in doing stuff. In these meetings, who have you? met with that you were like very very <laughs> like holy shit this is a moment now i'm like nervous as hell m m there, like, there's no question m, so the first one yeah well so i didn't meet m for a while because it was really just through paul and yeah. at the time he was working on his new album which mm-hmm. just came out um a couple months ago and so um yeah i mean look i um you know i'm of that age right where like you know um his first album came out i was i just graduated high, uh, college Right, so you know, you're right in that time, like I mean, you know, it's it's yeah. Eminem, right? It's yeah. like, and so um, yeah, so that was the, the first one, and frankly, um, I was really nervous, like leading up to it, and like I thought for a while, like I would, and when I got to it, he was so cool, and he was, and it was super easy, and when I was there, it was fine. Yeah. But like the two days before was the like, all right, like because at that point, I had already met a lot of people, and and uh-huh. you know, I mean. You like you know right like people yeah. are just people and at the end yeah. of the day it's not a big deal, and um, but M's yes. persona is not like he's gonna give you a hug at the meeting. No, like, he's gonna have his hat low. He's gonna be grilling your mm-hmm. ass. Yeah. right. So you knew that was happening, hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. And uh, but it's still he was great. And um, I don't know if have you ever seen the the video of me interviewing him. No. So um, we gotta was, check it out. Yeah, it it's it was unbelievable because um, we only had a very short period of time. Um, to do this this thing where um, – because we, we did this charity auction where they gave us um, a Jordan 4 Encore on the re-release. And so there were five shoes, and I just sort of talked through each one of them with him because there were different shoes from his past, a shoe he wore on stage, a shoe he autographed, and then the Encore. And, um, and he just started fucking around and was messing around, and I just went with it. And it was awesome. And it was like we filmed for five and a half minutes, and we had 445 of, like, usable content that made it into it. It was just wow. – yeah. He's a star. Yeah, he is. Absolutely. Um, why did you change the name from Campos to StockX? And was that like a personal sort of like, you know, this is my baby. Campos is my baby. Why, why are we calling it StockX? So it's interesting. There's, uh, there's something. So I got here, and um, the guys were calling the business Sold Trade. 
S O L E T R A D E. And if you don't know that there's 800 different blogs called Soul Collector and Soul, Soul Kicks Trade, and yeah, you yeah. know everything else, yeah. and in their mind it was a play off of like Ameritrade and like this this other gotcha. right okay. And um, and so I got there and I was like, listen, I was like. It doesn't have to be called campless, <laughs> but it cannot be called Soul Trade. And frankly, you can't have the word sneaker, kick, soul, anything in there. Like mm-hmm. That was my only requirement as we went there. I was like, it cannot, because with campless, the reason that we called it campless was was exactly that. It was like, I just wasn't going to try to cut through the clutter and create a brand against, you know, nice kick, sneaker news, you know, mm-hmm. kicks on fire and everyone. I was like, you, there had to be some unique name that yeah. sets it apart. And you either build a brand around it or you don't. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of like my foot in the sand with everyone I got here. And I wasn't like, it has to be campless. Right. I was like, but campless works for uh-huh. that. All right? right. And I was like, I was kind of pushing that. If we can't come up with something that is out of this sphere, like this is a good possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, we all we all were happy with StockX and think it's just Who it thought represents. of StockX? So we're not exactly sure. Yeah. Um, These brainstorm meetings, right? Like, yeah, yeah, I have some uh, some pictures from the whiteboards where there's like eight of us in a room and just words everywhere. Yeah. But I know that I came up with Stock Market X, mm-hmm. and, uh, and I think someone took that and shortened it, and we got to it. But it was also one of the things. So we almost named the company um, uh, Matter, M-A-T-T-E-R, mm-hmm. which in retrospect is, sounds fucking horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, but because uh, you'd be doing that every time, M A T T E R, like you well, know, this, part, part of that, there'd be yeah. a lot of reasons, right? Yeah. Right. And I forget why we thought it was a good name, but here's the thing: so a lot of times it comes down to the domain. Mm-hmm. So Mark Cuban owned the domain M A T T E R, <laughs> right? So we had Dan email Mark, yeah, and say, hey, you know, da da da, I have, you know, I know these guys are interested in this domain, B- billionaire, to billionaire. Hey, mm-hmm. can you give me matter dot com? Right. And Mark replies with like one line that says, Twitter offered a million. I said no. Period. And that was it. And Dan's like, fuck him. We're not, you know. So like, we didn't even bother going down that path of doing right. it. So thank you, Mark Cuban, for not selling his matter. <laughs> right. An awesome and, uh, and then StockX, we were able to get for, you know, someone owned it, but, you know, they didn't know what we were doing with it. And so yeah. we bought it for, I don't know, $20,000. Right. So. Um, okay. So here's another question. A lot of entrepreneurs that I meet have, in their head anyway, like a genius idea, right? And then someone comes and says, hey, I want to hear your idea. So tell me all about it because I want to help you. But then there's this fear that like, well, if I tell him the whole idea, I lose the idea potentially. And he's got more money, more power, more connections. He could steal the idea like that. Were you afraid that Dan and co were going to just swipe the idea out from under your feet? So first of all, I love this question. I love the fact that, that you're asking this question because one of my like personal, say like a rule to live by, I believe more than anything that ideas are worthless and execution is everything. Mm-hmm. And um, and I, I shared with you the ISMS book, which is kind of like the uh, Quicken Loans culture book. And one of the um, ISMS is, the way they say it is, um, ideas are rewarded, um, execution is worshipped, or something like that, right? Um, here's my thing. Um, if you have such a good idea that you're going to share it with someone else, mm-hmm. right? And they have the time. They're not already doing something valuable, right? right? And are going to go do it and can do it better than you. Mm-hmm. The expertise, yeah. Right? Then, like, you shouldn't be doing it anyway. Like, you know? <laughs> really? And But the, the other thing is, like, first of all, like, you're going to go take it to someone who's who has the ability to execute this better than you and they're not already working on something and have the time, who do you know that's that good at something mm-hmm. that has all the time in the world to go execute this thing that you want to dedicate your whole life to? You go do this full time, whatever you think your idea is, quit your job and you put all your time and energy into it. Like there's no way someone else should be able to beat that to you, including someone who has a, a, a billion dollars because yeah. the reality is you still have to go out and build that team and have people. And if you're the if you're the expert in it or you're the one who's passionate and going to put the time is like – Execution is, is all that matters. And it's funny is like we interview people all the time. In fact, I feel like that's all I do anymore at StockX since we've been growing so fast. We're up to 130 people. And um, and I will take the, the the hard worker right every single time than the idea guy mm-hmm. or the like mm-hmm. – The and, talker. Yeah, yeah. Or like sure, there's lots of good ideas. But, but shit, do you know how many things that we wish we could execute? We don't have the bandwidth to execute. Right. There's a million ideas about like – yeah. So – 
I don't know, that's a lot. And I'm, I, I, I've felt this from the very early, um, early age because as an entrepreneur, I've been out there and asked people for advice. And then as I've become more successful, I've been on the other side. And I have kids that show up with like an NDA. And I'm like, get the fuck out of here. There's right. zero chance I'm going to sign your NDA to give you advice, let alone the fact that I'm taking the time to talk to you right. or whatever. And someone made that very clear to me very, when I was very early and uh-huh. young. It's like, listen, like, there's nothing that reeks of more like, you know, naive and amateur than, than showing up and asking someone for their advice, like carrying an NDA. Like, Good advice. Yeah. So you knew going into that first meeting with Dan that you weren't – you already knew this. You weren't going to try to go in there with an NDA. No, no, no. And, and – Here's the thing is I've been out there pitching this idea for over a year. Right. So a lot Nike. of people knew yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, and, and, and it was, you know, Nike has certainly has the resources that mm-hmm. if they thought more about it. But, no, like it, the other thing is like they still have to have someone to do with that. So if you're Nike and you see that idea, right, you either say this is an amazing idea and this is the right person to do it with because, you know, they're passionate about it, they want to do it, yeah. right? Or you say, we're going to take this idea and try to force someone else to execute it or whatever. So, yeah, so I've been pitching this to, to many people for a long time. And, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, and it was just crazy that Dan literally had the exact same idea. Yeah, it's great advice. Mm-hmm. Um, you said earlier that the one thing you didn't want to do was do something within sneakers because that was your passion, Right. Now, how do you feel? You've somehow combined your passion of sneakers with your job, entrepreneurship. It's your livelihood now. Are you still impassioned about sneakers as you were before? Yeah. It, I mean, it's unbelievable. Like, it is It's just absolutely unbelievable to, first of all, to be a part of that community and to have created something, you know, in that community, to have friends that I grew up, you know, buying sneakers with that, you know, email me and, and be like, oh, I... Friends, I guys I went to bat, you know, played high school basketball with. It'll mm-hmm. email me like, remember those shoes we used to wear then? You know, I yeah. bought them on StockX. Like that's it's just amazing. That's so cool. Um, yeah. And and yeah and yeah, it's just like as someone who's outside looking in for so long and just a consumer and just a, a reader of tweets from from you and you know and Russ and Matt and you. I mean, like to now to be a part of that and sitting here with you, like it's it's unbelievable. And like maybe I should have tried to do that earlier, or maybe this was just the way that it was supposed to happen. Yeah. Exactly. So you don't have any loss of passion for the culture now that you, you're you really entrenched in it? I don't have any loss of passion. I have a much more objective view of uh, sneakers, mm-hmm. particularly the condition of sneakers and boxes as I see our <laughs> customer service and what happens as people freak the fuck out over, like, you know, the stitching is off on their Yeezys or there's some manufacturing defect or whatever. Like, I used to get upset if I'd get a, a pair of shoes and had a manufacturing defect or a box and, like, it's like, yeah. man... You know, they're just shoes. I, I, I certainly wear my shoes more often than, than I did before and, and have a, a slightly different viewpoint on it. Yeah. Um, but no, like it's, it's amazing. I, well, I love when it. you were giving me the tour of the space, you were saying about some of the interesting things that you find when people send in their <laughs> shoes, right? So what are some interesting things that like you found in shoe boxes? Yeah, that's amazing. I, I definitely did not expect that. Um, apparently, people hide a lot of different stuff in shoe boxes yeah. at their house. It's not just a rap lyric. Like, <laughs> no. They actually hide valuable stuff in their shoe boxes. Yeah, well, so today um, uh, you, you met the guy who runs our operations facility. And they found an envelope with seventy five hundred dollars in cash in the shoebox with the shoes in it. With the shoes in it, so I guess this guy was hiding the cash in his shoebox. He emailed us uh, and said, "Hey, uh, you're about to get a shoe, a box, and and please, can you find this?" And and we found it, and we're gonna return it to him. But yeah. um, the number one thing we find in shoeboxes is, drum roll, it's weed. It's weed, right? Like yeah. kids hide their weed in their shoe boxes and, and uh, then forget and sell it and, and ship it to us. And sometimes we have to reject the shoe because now the shoes smell like weed and we can't sell them. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and those of pe- course they would forget that there was weed in it because they were smoking weed. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> exactly. The right. real question is, do they weed in every shoe box, right? Or just, or just, just one, or, one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no one has ever claimed their weed. Uh, we've, <laughs> we get people have said, "Oh, I accidentally sent you money." They want their money back. No one's been like, you know, they just kind of pretend like it didn't happen. And yeah. um, we have to, you know, we call um, the we call security, the building security, and make sure it's it's. You know, whatever happens to it after it leaves our facility is fine. But um, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's so, the power of a Dan Gilbert organization. You've got people, we have yeah. we have our own security force. Yeah. Did, did you see the security room? Yeah. Did they take you to that? Yeah, time? yeah. That's pretty cool, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's talk about the state of sneakers really quick. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's not much of a, a better expert that we can speak to about the state of sneakers without having to wear the sort of like Nike or Adidas or or Foot Locker hat, right? Everyone's got an initiative in this. Everyone's got an angle. 
I think you have a true sort of just barometer of what's going on in, in the market. Um, so you mentioned Matt Powell before, who was an industry retail expert in footwear, right? And Matt Powell, if you follow, I highly suggest if you're into the sneaker game, you should read Matt Powell's Twitter account because he loves, he reverse trolls on people like crazy, yeah. right? But he, his big thing is that Kanye and Pharrell and the rest of them have nothing, zero, zilch to do with the success of those brands. True or false? False. 100% false. And you'll argue him in his face with this? Yeah, it's funny because... Um, I follow Matt Powell on Twitter, and and I feel like we all kind of take our turns going after him. And like I spent I spent a good um, I spent a good day. Uh, I think it was like really early on at StockX, um, and I just took my turn, and and I just I spent all day just going back and forth with him, and like you know, and I was like, look. You're not arguing with a, like a 14 year old kid here, like now you know. And uh, I'm a quant. Yeah, I've got like um, data here. Yeah, and, uh, and it was fun, and I felt like I, I made some some good points. And, Does he uh, honestly believe yeah. it, or is he trolling? I, I he's got to be trolling. He's got to be trolling because he's clearly a smart enough guy, right? He clearly, you know, look, he, he's an old guy who's not in touch with the culture. Fine, right. But he's a smart enough guy to understand that. So like, I almost feel like he has to be trolling. <laughs> but I've I've never met him in person, uh-huh. and and and. I've never met him in person, so this is not my opinion. But the people that I know that met him in person think that he's just an unbelievable dick, and like just think like, do, like the guy's a complete asshole and don't like him. And uh, this is secondhand, so I'm not saying yeah. I'm not saying that. But and so I don't know. Like maybe that's what he maybe that's how he thinks he stays relevant by mm-hmm. keeping this fight going. Right. Because certainly when he fights it, like everybody tunes in to see who's gonna like argue yeah. against it. But like that's ridiculous. Yeah. So what is your opinion of it? Because there is the, – the Yeezys and stuff are relative to a Stan Smith or a Superstar or an Ultra Boost, very small quantity. So is it – but you really feel that there is a halo trickle effect happening? Yeah. Yeah, and that's the key, right? It, the, the, the theory of the halo effect, mm-hmm. right, is that you can't get a Yeezy, and so you will then buy a, a different Adidas. Uh, yeah, Tubular Doom, yeah. which looks like the Yeezy. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah. And, but I think what Adidas has done really good with, with – particularly with Yeezy – Right is one getting Kanye in, and Pharrell getting them in other Adidas products rather mm-hmm. than their own. Right, we saw Kanye first wearing Ultra Boost before the Yeezy came out. All right, we've seen you know uh, Pharrell has the Stan Smith has a Stan Smith, you know whatever call yeah. that collab you know thing that he does with Stan Smith as well, and um, and have been had they've been very careful about not increasing the quantity of those too much, mm-hmm. right? They started really small with the Yeezy. You know, it was rumored there were 9,000 pairs of that first 750. And even on the, the last big one, so when they did the Beluga 2.0 and they did the, um, the Blue Tint, which there was rumored to be a half a million pairs of those, they were still reselling for about double retail, mm-hmm. right? Which means the demand is so great, they've done a good job of not producing more supply than demand. Yeah. And as long as you do that and mm-hmm. can keep that gap, right? Then like just by nature, right? There's just, there's so many other shoes that touch that because of Boost, because of NMDs, because yeah. of shoes that look like that. They've done a good job of creating other silhouettes around that that look like that. Like right. it's it's just obvious. It's a, it's a huge stretch from making the argument that Back when Jordan sold out, that oh, you know, the Jordan 11, uh, you know, um, Concord sold out, so I'm gonna go buy a a, a mellow, mm-hmm. right? Like, that's a stretch, yeah, yeah. like th- that's so that's so far different from a, an aesthetic. And even though they're both basketball shoes, mm-hmm. they're so far different as opposed to having we're gonna go buy an ultra boost. Oh, and guess what? We're gonna buy the ultra boost that Kanye was wearing because it's a white on white ultra boost, right. right? So, I just think Adidas has done a really good job mm-hmm. of leveraging that strategy, yeah. I mean, at the height of it, there was a moment where inline NMDs, like non collaborative NMDs, were selling above retail, yeah, it's unheard of, yeah, yeah. regular shoe sells above retail. That was crazy, yeah, yep, yep. Okay, um, I recently did an interview with Sarah from Colette, and she was reminiscing on the old days of how when she first started Colette, you know, Nike would drop 10 special edition shoes a year. Like, we're talking like oh, air woven here, you know what I mean? And then like the, a sock dart there. Now, as you know, it's multiple exclusive limited edition drops a week. She thinks that there's a, there's a glass ceiling to this. There's going to be a, a full saturation point where it can't go beyond. What do you think? The idea of a of a of a true ceiling, um, it exists on an individual shoe, right? On an individual model, right? And that's just the basic supply and demand of it, right? Mm-hmm. So for 
whatever the next Jordan that's going to come out, right? Um, there absolutely is a ceiling. You can, can only produce so many. But what the brands have done well is creating more shoes, mm-hmm. right? And so doing a portfolio that. of shoes that are all activating, right? Right. And and so, and, but but she's right that at some point, because you know this massive growth that we had in the in the sneaker industry, in both resale and retail, from 2011 to 2013 was really about more people coming mm-hmm. into the market, right. right? And it was really on the back of Instagram, right? Mm-hmm. All sneakers ever want to do is show off their shoes and see other people's shoes. Mm-hmm. And so as Instagram was going through its own hockey stick growth during that period of time, you had all these new people coming into the resale market. Right. And then with sites like StockX, and there's, there's others, Goat, Stadium Goods, who have made it easier to buy shoes where you don't have to go through mm-hmm. on eBay, et cetera, we continue to bring in more people. And we right. already see that at StockX. And so Sarah's right in that at some point, the same number of people can only buy X number of shoes per week, per year, per whatever. Right. But the, the variable that I don't think we fully understand yet is how many more people can we continue to bring over, essentially call it, I don't want to say resale, right, but from retail to resale, mm-hmm. from that Foot Locker customer to the Collect customer, or that Foot Locker customer to the StockX customer. Correct. And and how big is that side of right. the market? And how fast is that growing? Right. right. It used to be unheard of that someone owned more than 10 pairs of shoes. Like, right. You, right. you'd be called crazy if you owned 10 pairs of shoes. 100%. Now, I feel like that number's like 50. Like, 50 is like, you're still somewhat normal. Yeah, yeah. Right? And that was only like five years ago, really. <laughs> that's funny. We should, uh, figure, we should figure out the data on that. The and, average, and, and yeah. How we figure that out, I don't know. But that's that's That's, a, that's like, a, it's a right. barometer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 But uh, and she, uh, she's right. But I, I think that what we don't know is as we continue to bring more people to this side, that, that glass ceiling does go up. Yeah. Um, respond to this, which is I'm sure you've heard. Resellers are ruining it for the true fans. It's just... The, it's, such, it's such bullshit, right? Well, okay, yeah. so defend. Yeah, because <laughs> defend first, owner first of all, StockX. First of all, <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm not biased no bias that at here. all. Um, uh, in 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 January of 2015, when I spoke at, at the Nike offsite, the title of my presentation before I got to the slide about I applied every year was "Don't kill the resale market," mm-hmm. right? And everyone in the room was like, "Oh, he's biased. Like he's you know." First of all, define true fans, right? Like that's the problem is define true fans. Mm-hmm. Here's the thing. The game is great, right? Nobody wants every shoe to be available. If you, if you could walk into the store, if anybody can walk into the store and buy a pair of shoes, no one's going to want it. If you can mm-hmm. walk, buy the same pair of shoes that my mother can buy, mm-hmm. like, and my mother's really cool, but no one else thinks that, right? Yeah. So like, Or if you walk into like a classroom and all other 30 students right. are wearing that shoe, you don't want to wear that 100%, shoe. 100%. That's right? human nature. It's human yeah. nature. It's right. not about sneakers. It's not about, but everybody wants to be on the side that gets them. Right, mm-hmm. everybody wants to be able to get them, but have other people don't. And so, resellers are winning the game is a is a very like myopic view of like, I didn't get the shoe. Yeah, and that's fair. And like, you're supposed to be upset, and that's part of the game, right? So FOMO was right. part of it. FOMO was absolutely <laughs> part of it. But like, if if you think for a second that you would like it better the other way, like you're just fucking kidding yourself. Like, there's sure I really really want you know whatever the off-white ones and i didn't get the off-white ones but literally if they were as ubiquitous as a as a whatever Sketchers. yeah right <laughs> yeah no then no one's gonna want the off-white like that's it's such bullshit right, right. And, and but it, it is actually the the intended reaction and it is the natural human reaction to think that way mm-hmm. but like logically it's just bullshit but doesn't technology have a huge play in this because so when we were young we wanted to shoot. You wanted the Concords really mm-hmm. bad. You couldn't get them. There was a variable. It was price, whatever. But you couldn't get them. Now technology has allowed it so that you can get it. Isn't that really like the differentiation? It, so that's a really, really good point, right? Because there's an argument to be made that what we're not mad at resellers, we're mad at bots, mm-hmm. right? Or we're mad at that people that are cheating the system mm-hmm. in order to be the ones that get it. Okay, that's fair. But back in the day, there was no bots, but... The guy who's you know cousin worked at the store for, got he's the one who got the shoes right. every time anyway right. right. Or the guy who brought the baseball bat to the lineup got in the front of the line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's other versions. There's yeah. always been some version of this. Right. Right. The fact is, there's at least some part of the the limited sneaker market today that is truly, truly um, democratic. Right. Mm-hmm. Like Nike sneakers app. We all just enter the raffle and maybe we win and maybe we don't. You know. 
sure, I'm, I'm sure there are some sketchy things that go on at raffles at sneaker stores. Right, but at least some of that is random, yeah. right? That you possibly could win the raffle. Now, there's still first come, first serve, still backdoor stuff, there's still bots, there's always gonna be parts of that, right? right? But at the end of the day, like, there's always been some way around the system and having it connect and, yeah. you know, like. It's sort of another human nature type thing, right? Like, if, if you and I check into the same hotel and I got a suite and you didn't, and you're like, how'd you get the suite? I slipped the guy at 20 yeah. when I checked in. That's a lesson learned. Oh, you slip a guy at 20, that's yeah. how you get a better room. That's like 100%. 101 basic, right? 100%. Yeah, and that's mm-hmm. not changing. So no. this is really just like reality at the end of the day. 100%. Do you ever feel like the hype now that sneaker companies achieve feels a little manufactured? Whereas maybe like when we started out in the SB days and stuff, it felt really organic. And this is just my perspective. But do you feel that way too? Like, Do you feel like it's kind of manufactured right now? So... Um When's this going to air? <laughs> uh, not in a while. Like, not in a while? Yeah, yeah. Okay. A couple weeks. All right. Okay. So um, we just did, or we'll have just done. You can edit that however you want. Okay. Um, we're doing a release with Trolley. What's Trolley? Trolley is the gummy candy company Okay. <laughs> that made gummy James Harden shoes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right? And and this is a this is a project with Adidas and Trolley as a, a way to release gummy James Harden uh like their gummy candies, okay, candies. that look like James Harden sh- shoes, right. the, the Harden 2. And um and we're literally doing a release with them. And like there's probably no greater definition of like manufactured hype than the fact that like we're literally doing a release for a gummy sneaker. It's going to be like the world's like largest gummy sneaker. And like when this was first brought to me, I was like get the fuck out of here. I'm like, there's no way like we're doing this mm-hmm. with like a gummy sneaker, right. right? On the other hand, like Adidas is behind this, Harden is behind this, like, and to be part of that, and like, I actually, like, I really love gummy candies. Like, <laughs> I, I eat gummy candies like all day around. And so we did it because we thought it would be, a, you know, a, a sort of fun thing and a funny thing to be a part of. But yeah, I mean, we're at an age where like everything is that is that much more produced, right? Mm-hmm. And there's way more thought that goes into the marketing and, and the creation of the hype. And that's why, though, it's really great when you see like the off-white collection. As much as the, there was hype built into that and created, like the true demand that happened mm-hmm. there and everybody like, oh man, I really want those shoes. It still crashed Nike site on the second release. Mm-hmm. The shoes are still going up nonstop, you know, in value today, you yeah. know, even though we have other ones coming out. So it is great to see some of that genuine organic hype that happens because of Virgil and Off-White and his mm-hmm. whole history and everything else. Right. Like I feel like that's really like true organic hype the way we used to think of because of who he is. Yeah. And the fact that like Adidas wants to do a, a, a collab with Trolley mm-hmm. and StockX is involved in that, right? Yeah. It's just a it's sort it's a right. There's, opposite only, end of there's only so much that a sneaker company can manufacture before the public has to decide what's going to be the verdict of this, you know, of this shoe or not. Like whether it's going to be hyped or not. Right. And and here's the thing. And so for this, we decided, look, this isn't trying to compete with an off-white one, right? Mm-hmm. This is literally trying to compete with like gummy worms, right? Yeah. Like right? And like that's okay and I think it's fun. It's just a fun thing to be a part of without like thinking of it too critically. And mm-hmm. by the way, you know, we talked earlier about sort of my passion for sneakers and everything I've become a lot less um a lot less like uh I don't know insider mm-hmm. like you know it used to be like this thing and it's not you know I don't want people in, great everyone should love sneakers everyone like should be a part of it and and yeah I, I just think it, it is it's good to become more mainstream you yeah. can still you can still maintain whatever sort of insider part that you have right like I'm wearing the original De La Soul Dunks like mm-hmm. you know it's okay that if no one else knows what they are yeah there's the inside. Yeah, yeah, like, but I think it's great that it, it's mainstream. Sneakers are awesome. Yeah, you mentioned earlier about the Jordan problem, where it's been years since you've seen Jordan sitting, even retro ones. It's it's unheard of. It's never happened before. Um, if you were sitting with high level Jordan people at the table, how would you address this issue with them? Yeah, I, I've I've been doing it. I, I, you okay, know, <laughs> so but, you have been talking to them. Yeah, I mean publicly and privately, um, I've been telling them for years to to stop supply right like end it yeah like, no well not just to stop supply like stop oversupplying the problem is okay. oversupply right i mean it's the whole thing is just a supply and demand game and so you know the, it that just it's counterintuitive to a retail company that they they want to sell as many products as they can exactly. i get that that's their business um especially when you're telling them to stop supply of retro product but the other product 
no one's really buying ever. Right. So what are we going to make money from? Right. Tell 100%, me, Josh. Hundred <laughs> percent. It, it is not an easy conversation. But here's how the math works. So let's say that demand for any shoe is a hundred. Right. Demand for a shoe is a hundred. If you produce ninety six, then all those will sell out instantly. Right. Mm-hmm. hundred people want it. Ninety six available. No problem. They'll all get bought. There'll be some secondary market. A couple pairs will get sold. Great. But if demand is a hundred and they produce one hundred one. Mm-hmm. They might only sell 70 or 60 or some number way below 96, Mm -hmm. right? Because as soon as you cross that threshold, we're now into the territory we talked earlier where anybody can buy it. And And they're everywhere, yeah. And all of a sudden, like, people don't, you know, don't want them. There's Mm -hmm. some, call it true demand, whatever that number is, maybe 60. 60 of those people is true demand. We will buy it. doesn't matter if if everyone else has it. We just want that shoe. But there's some part that's like sneakerhead demand that sits in there. And so there's some number, right? Once you cross it, you will actually sell, you know, some percentage less. And that's why actually financially it makes sense. The problem is that that number of demand, it's not an exact science. Right. right? And that's the hard part for Nike to – to balance and like in my mind and my advice I've said this publicly and privately every single time is like you have to err on the side of, of going under. under but Jordan in the past few years has been hammering that number that you they, they've gone over every time oh, like it's just, yeah not even like accidentally over no like no, no. straight raping 100 percent, 100 percent. and and they've been fortunate that some of those the demand number is so high black cement threes mm-hmm. right bread space ones jam. right space jams that number is so high that they still resell for a little bit even with putting a million pairs into the market right honestly do you think it's greed it's not, greed's the wrong word to look at it, right? Okay. It's corporate it's, initiative. It's, it's business. <laughs> it's business. Like, it's business. Like, they have obligations to the shareholders and the company. Like, there's only, there's only two ways to, to, increase, to increase sales and increase either you sell more or you sell it for a higher price, mm-hmm. right? And the way that companies like that work, it's like you have certain targets you have to beat last year. And, like, I worked at IBM. Like, I, I know that. And it yeah. sucks right. from a consumer standpoint that we end up in the middle of it. But, like, at some point, our interests should align uh-huh. and they should start to cut back, cut, cut back supply and make it a little bit more limited. The problem yeah. is at the exact same time they were doing that, Adidas was running the exact opposite strategy around and Yeezy it, yeah. and Pharrell and, and totally taking advantage of it. Right. And that's why, you know, right now in StockX, over 60% of our business is Adidas. Mm-hmm. And how about when it started? Uh, probably about like 2%. Yeah. <laughs> 2 to 60, yeah. yeah. You know the beautiful thing about business is that if you're talking to these Jordan people, right, you either should do it on your own, but if you don't, the problem will self rectified like you're gonna have to do it eventually and mm-hmm. now they're at that point where it's like they just have to do it not because it's by choice but they just have to now yeah because the public doesn't want it anymore right. so they're reducing numbers regardless that's right and, and they um they actually just did it uh last week or two weeks ago with the jordan 9 bread the the black and red version mm-hmm. which we didn't think would resell at all here at stock yeah. like it's a jordan 9 right like you know and uh, and apparently that they must have really cut supply because mm-hmm. that was our top seller for like a, a couple of days, um, and that only happens if you know if the there's not enough. Up, right. Yeah, so uh, so I think they're they're taking it to heart a little bit and understand. And by the way, you know Larry Miller made a public statement about three or four months ago saying they recognized that they had oversupplied the market, which is kind of crazy that that. That, you know, I'm sure he's known this for a long time, and Jordan yeah. Brand executives. But, but the, now saying it publicly yeah. that we recognize we've oversupplied, like that's a yeah. yeah, totally. But you don't get to be a subdivision of a brand and be the number two biggest brand in the world. Still, you know, that's crazy. That like they're a yeah. division of Nike, but the second biggest sneaker company in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's crazy. You don't get there by not selling a lot of shoes, right? Um, so finally, what does the future look like for for this market? In your opinion, is there going to be a dramatic shift a reset button a bubble bursting or do you think this market is just going to keep growing and growing and growing yeah so which there were a lot of options you just gave there yeah. what's um, your what's your thinking first let me just say that i don't think there's a bubble that bursts okay um you know there's everyone the only way a bubble truly bursts is if all the brands decide to just stop making any limited exclusive shoes at all mm-hmm. and say we're just going to oversupply every single shoe, right? There's Yeezys are going to be available, you know, 24-7, et cetera. And um, 
and that just doesn't make sense for any reason at all. Mm -hmm. um, not the least of which everything we just talked about, but second of all, just inventory costs. And third of all, if you do that, something else will be limited, and then the cool kids will just go wear yeah. whatever, like they're starting to wear monarchs again, right? Right. Yep. Um, so, so I just think that it doesn't happen. There, there's not a crash. The future, I think, is, and this is part of the hypothesis around StockX, we start to blur the line between retail and resale, mm -hmm. right? That ultimately we get to where there's more of a, of a single market on this. As the brands start to, and, you know, StockX is absolutely leading the charge in this, but I don't think we'll be the only one to do this, is to work directly with the brands as mm -hmm. the primary and secondary markets work together. In almost every business context, primary and secondary markets start out at odds in mortgages, you know, in, and eventually they work together because it's beneficial to work together. Right. And so I think what we'll see is, I think we'll start to see more of a, of a single market and converging. And we already see this from a channel distribution, right, where, you know, everyone talks about sort of the death of Foot Locker and retail and everyone's concerned about that. But Foot Locker gets its squeeze from resale coming this way and Nike going more direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. Right, and they start to sort of meet in the middle, yeah. and you know, and does Foot Locker die? Does retail die? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Although Nike leverages Foot Locker really well for their showrooms, right? Like we started this conversation around that Nike doesn't have, you know, a lot of uh, stores anymore, yeah. and they leverage that. So, anyway, I, I think it's a long way of saying that no bubble. I think it continues to grow, and I think that you know um, we'll just start to see a lot more merging of the of all the different segments of it. Retail, resell, brands, and everyone starts to work together. Are you saying that, like, in in hypothetically five to ten years, there won't really be an MSRP on shoes anymore? Maybe a It'll little be like avocados. Yeah, yeah I, I, <laughs> like you walk into a, a supermarket, it's like avocados could be five dollars one day, two dollars another day. I, honestly, and and you sort of set this one up for me. Not like avocados, like stocks, right? <laughs> like you have a market price, uh -huh. right? It moves, you know, real time with the market. And at, at the most fundamental level, like that's what a stock market is. It's a variable price mm -hmm. that moves real time with the market. And the better you can understand consumer demand, which again is, is that's the problem with, with oversupply, or whatever, is you don't know exactly what consumer demand is. But the better you can understand consumer demand, then you can leverage um, variable pricing and do that the way that airlines do today. Right, um, you know, avocados and, and produce do that purely on supply. Yeah. Right, because they have a good idea that there's whatever they can sell through X avocados at, at these locations because they've been selling the same avocado for years and years and years through that store, and so it's about what supply is, is left to be able to do that. So I do. I, I think for certain products and sneakers being one of them, in certain categories, we get to where there's more of a variable price. Not for all shoes, right? You always need to be able to walk in the store and you want to buy spend thirty nine dollars on a pair of shoes. You can spend. 39 hours on a pair of shoes mm -hmm. but in this segment that I do think it ends up where you have a lot more variable pricing mm. interesting I, I personally think there's going to be a day where a kid let's go back to that analogy of a kid walking into a classroom there's going to be 30 kids in the classroom every kid has on either a quick strike an exclusive a player edition or a Nike ID and the kid with the white Chuck Taylor is the coolest kid in the room that I, that that almost makes the, my point earlier, which is that if if all the brands just put out as much supply as possible, then uh -huh. the cool kids would just find whatever is rare, or limited, or different. Which could be the Air Monarchs. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, we've <laughs> right. seen you know like John Elliott just did a, a fashion show where they were wearing Monarchs, right? And and yeah. it's just every that's human nature, right? To right. a point, like that is human nature around finding something other people don't have, uh -huh. et cetera. But um, that's an interesting uh, classroom. Yeah. Right, think Everyone's about, right? a hype beast. In yeah, the teacher, the teachers wearing like you know whatever. Yeah, Air Mags. Thir third version of <laughs> yeah. Of, that's great. All right. Uh, yeah. Last question. Yeah. What is the most amount of money you've spent on a shoe? Uh, honestly, it was um, it was about uh, a month ago, um, and I really wanted the Presto off lights, and I never spent a thousand dollars on a pair of shoes, and I spent. Uh, just under a thousand dollars on StockX. Um, right now, they've gone up another four hundred dollars since then. I was basically watching it, and the price just kept going up. And, and you I was knew like, that "You had to just." And I, yeah, and I was like, "Shit, if I'm ever going to get them, like, I just have to buy them now." And I, yeah. I'd never spent more than like f about four fifty in that range. I'd never spent five hundred. It was kind of a, um, and like I just, I just want them. And I was like, "Fuck it, I'm buying it." So it's most I've ever spent by far. And you wear them? Yeah, I wear them all the time. If I was wearing them yesterday. Do you get a uh, employee promo code? Very, very small. This is you know, we get people ask all the time, 
Uh, the problem is that we're a marketplace, right? Yeah. We're not, so all we have is, is the margin that, that we charge the seller, you know, yeah. which is which is 9%. So there is a, a small employee discount at StockX, but um, but yeah, I still paid almost $1,000 for them. Yeah, I mean, how many shoes do you move a month? Shit, I don't even, a month. We move, um, it's a, right now it's about 6000 a day, so I don't know, whatever that is, a month, 200000 200000 a month. Yeah. But yet you hold no inventory. Right. We're just a marketplace. All we're doing is connecting buyers and sellers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. All right, man. Well, thanks. That was awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's good talking to you. Yeah. Sweet. Good interview. Thanks, man. I hope you have someone who, who edits all that for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's hating right now that he's got to hear this. I know. Was <laughs> like, what was that? Almost two hours? An hour and a half. An hour yeah. and a half? Okay. Well, good. Hopefully there's some good stuff in there. Yep. Stuff in there? 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 Yep.